doctor, and he did not even visit his father on his deathbed. Toward the end of this period, Descartes spent an increasing amount of time in Paris. Here he met an old school friend from La Fleche, Marine Mersenne, who had joined the church. Father Mersenne had become a highly respected man of learning, in contact with the great minds of Europe. From Paris, Mersenne corresponded with such figures as Pascal, Fermat, and Gassendi. Mersenne's cell became a sort of clearing house for the latest ideas in mathematical, scientific, and philosophic thinking. This was just the kind of friend Descartes needed, and he was to correspond with Mersenne for the rest of his life, sending him manuscripts and testing his ideas on him both for their validity and to determine whether they conflicted with the teachings of the Church. Descartes spent most of his time in Paris, closeted in his room, studying. Occasionally friends would come round to discuss ideas with him. Sometimes he was even persuaded out to more formal occasions. An anecdote relates how he was present at the residence of the papal nuncio when a certain Chandou delivered a talk outlining a new philosophy. At the end of the talk, Descartes proceeded to dismember this new philosophy with the aid of some rigorous mathematical reasoning, to which Chandou had no reply. After following Descartes' skilful arguments, Cardinal de Berulle took him aside and strongly advised him to devote his life to philosophy. For some reason, this counsel appeared to win over Descartes. Visions and dreams may have inspired confidence in him, but it took the rational approach to urge him toward decisive action. In 1628, he retired to the north of France to live in seclusion and devote himself entirely to his thinking. Unfortunately, his Parisian friends continued to visit him, so Descartes journeyed even farther afield and went to live in isolation in Holland, where he settled for more than two decades, until the year before his death. But settled is very much a relative term where Descartes is concerned. During the first fifteen years of his residence in Holland, he is known to have changed houses at least eighteen times. In between, when the settled domestic routine became all too much for him, he frequently travelled abroad. Only Father Mersenne could keep up with his address. This constant movement is put down to Descartes' love of solitude, but it seems to speak of some deeper restlessness. In the course of travelling, or even moving his home, one can't help meeting people, even if only in passing fashion. This unending movement suggests that Descartes' solitude was not entirely self-sufficient. He was lonely, but found it impossible to make contact with people except in the most trivial manner. Descartes always had servants, and he appears to have cut quite a personable figure. The portraits we have of him depict a pale-faced gentleman in the dark flowing wig of the period. His mustachioed, drip-bearded features have a certain saturnine charm. He is said to have dressed well in fashionable knee-breeches, black silk stockings, and silver buckle shoes. A silk scarf was always around his neck to protect it from the cold, and whenever he went out he wore a woollen scarf and heavy coat, and always put on his sword. He is said to have been sensitive to the slightest change of temperature, which he claimed affected the inherited weakness of his chest. Yet he spent years travelling throughout Europe, from Italy to Scandinavia, and the country he finally chose to live in was Holland, notorious for its rain, fog, and ice which a contemporary French visitor described as four months of winter followed by eight months of cold. Or perhaps this was just the ideal spot for a dedicated hypochondriac. But Holland had one great advantage. In the seventeenth century it was the duty-free zone of the European mind. Unlike in other nations, here you didn't have to pay for your ideas. The tolerant Dutch had dispensed with such heavy-duty items as the Inquisition, heresy, the rack, and burning at the stake, critical accolades that greeted original thinkers elsewhere in Europe. Of the four great thinkers who produced original philosophy during the seventeenth century, no less than three, Descartes, Spinoza, and Locke, lived for periods in Holland. The other, Leibniz, lived across the border in Hanover, and visited Holland several times. Partly as a result of this liberal atmosphere, Holland also became a thriving centre of the printing industry, with works by such advanced thinkers as Galileo and Hobbes being published there. It was a time when new ideas thrived in Holland as nowhere else in Europe. 
Descartes began this productive period of his life with high hopes. As a result of his vision in the Bavarian stove, he had conceived of a universal science capable of embracing all human knowledge. This would arrive at truth by the use of reason. But this was much more than just a revolutionary new method. Reason had played very much a backseat role in the sciences and alchemies of the Middle Ages. Descartes had conceived of a system that would not only include all knowledge, but also unite it. This system would be free from prejudices and assumptions, and would be based on certainty alone. It would start from basic principles, which were themselves self-evident, and would build from these. Descartes foresaw immense advantages from his system. He confidently predicted that when this new scientific method was applied to medicine, it would be able to slow the aging process. This was Descartes' persistent dream. Ten years later he wrote to the Dutch scholar Huygens that, despite his parlous physical condition, he expected to live until he was well over one hundred, though in the last decade of his life he revised this estimate downward by a few years. Descartes began writing a treatise that he called Rules for the Direction of the Mind. In order to discover the universal science, he argued, we first had to adopt a method of thinking properly. This method consisted of following two rules of mental operation, intuition and deduction. Intuition, Descartes defined as, the conception without doubt of an unclouded and attentive mind which is formed by the light of reason alone. Deduction was defined as, necessary inference from other facts which are known for certain. Descartes' celebrated method, which came to be known as the Cartesian method, lay in the correct application of these two rules of thought. Descartes was now gaining a reputation as a thinker on a wide range of philosophical and scientific subjects. In March 1629 the Pope and certain senior cardinals began observing UFOs in the sky above Rome. As the sun set, a solar halo would appear with orbiting spots of brilliant light. Letters were sent to Descartes and various other leading thinkers, asking their opinion of these visions. Descartes was so intrigued that for a time he gave up his philosophical thinking to concentrate on this matter. He had his suspicions about the cause of such phenomena, but refused to commit himself until several years later. By this time he had completed an entire treatise on the subject. Meanwhile, one Vatican source had offered its own explanation. The phenomena were caused by angels undertaking celestial scene changes in preparation for the second coming. Descartes suggested that these lights in the sky were caused by meteors. Unfortunately, modern scientists have an explanation that sounds even more implausible than the Vatican's. These phenomena, now called parhelia, are said to be caused when the sun shines through a thin cloud composed of hexagonal ice crystals falling with their principal axes vertical. Crystals performing formation dances in the atmosphere are now considered much more likely than angels, and simplistic explanations such as Descartes are laughed out of court. In this, as in many other matters, Descartes was alive during a brief and possibly unique era of human thought. The new explanations put forward by the finest scientific and philosophical minds of his time were in many cases both plausible and comprehensible. They also tended to be rational and, in their overall conception, simple, with the aim of leaving space for the contemplation of ultimate mysteries. Humanity is unlikely to experience such an era again. Afterward, it would become increasingly impossible to understand the truth, except in the narrowing field that one was capable of understanding. From now on we were to know more and more about less and less. Having laid down his rules for the working of the mind, Descartes now set about the outer world. For the next three years he composed a treatise on the universe. This contained his ideas on an enormous range of scientific subjects, including meteors, dioptrics, and geometry. In order to pursue his studies in anatomy, he now took to visiting the local slaughterhouse, returning home with various specimens hidden under his cloak so that he could dissect them in private. As a result of this work, Descartes originated the study of embryology. 
According to legend, on one of these visits to the abattoir, Descartes noticed a portly young man sketching the flayed carcass of an ox, and asked him why he had chosen such a subject. "'Your philosophy takes away our souls,' replied the artist. "'In my paintings I will give them back, even to dead animals.' The young artist is said to have been Rembrandt.